Right, can you all see that? Yes. So, uh, what's one of those? <laughs> what, what is a small box, as most instrumentation is now, it's all enclosed in the box, you know, for a good reason, because of uh, health and safety. But can anyone guess what that uh, instrument is here? Spectrophotometry. Well, it's like a spectrophotometer. Um, Colorimetry. This might give a clue. Malvern Instruments. Malvern Instruments are the manufacturer of a device uh, known as a dynamic light scattering instrument. Okay. And uh, this is a technique which uh, is relatively inexpensive. It's about 20 or 30,000 pounds. That, that may sound a lot of money, but when you compare that to the costs of uh, other types of instrumentation, NMR, uh, infrared spectroscopy, analytical centrifugation, uh, all these different methods. This is quite a, an inexpensive method. And although, although the physics is quite complicated behind it, that's all dealt with by the computer software. So it's uh, a relatively easy instrument to use. This, of course, is coupled to a uh, computer. And uh, it's become very important in, in biopharma uh, for two reasons, uh, two main reasons. Uh, well, well, three reasons. One, it's, it's very quick compared to other methods. Uh, and it's a method for getting uh, sizes and uh, conformations of molecules. But because it's it's quick, it's it's good at following uh, uh, dynamics of processes, how uh, how uh, processes uh, change. But there's two major applications in industry which uh, uh, are becoming uh, more and more significant. One is in uh, the big field of uh, of, of crystallography getting structures of uh, important uh, proteins uh, for uh, therapeutics. And uh, to get crystal structures, you need crystals. And some of the most interesting molecules are very difficult to crystallize. And this method helps uh, the crystallographers find the appropriate conditions, solvent conditions, which can uh, promote crystallization by the formation of, uh, of, of nuclei and things. Uh, so this is a very good method of, uh, of detecting that formation. But uh, more recently, there's a, a big focus on uh, monoclonal antibody therapies for the treatments of cancers, inflammatory diseases, and uh, other uh, serious uh, disease. The problem is that uh, these applications have to be, the formulations are usually high concentration. And uh, that means that there are issues concerning uh, molecular interactions, aggregation phenomena. And uh, dynamic light scattering is a very powerful method for assaying for aggregation uh, effects in uh, materials. And it offers another advantage, which I'll I'll mention later. So it's a technique that we, we need to be familiar with. Uh, if we end up uh, getting careers in, uh, in biopharma and indeed the food industries or go on to research where we're looking at the uh, properties of, uh, of macromolecules for application in, uh, in industry. So that's what the instrument looks like. Looks a bit unspectacular, but that's because it's in a box to cover the laser and things. Uh, let's just come out of this. So for the next uh, 45 minutes, uh, hi, George. Hello, George. Hi, Dan. Yeah, OK. Uh, there's just three of us. That's OK. This is a, a small uh, postgraduate uh, 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 gathering. How much of that did you get? Did you get the course introduction or just get the, the bit with the instrument? No, 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 I've been here the whole time. OK, that's good. Right, so we're going to switch to the lecture now. And that means switching to blah, 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 this screen here. Now, is it? 
Which one is it? It's this one. OK, right, here we go. And, you know, as postgraduate scientists, inquiring scientists, we're not content with just seeing a box instrument, which is a box, and then pressing buttons, correct? Yeah, you agree with me? Yes, that you yes. Want to know, you want to understand a bit more how they operate so you can assess whether a particular piece of instrumentation is applicable or not, and uh, what the limitations of the instrument are, and how the instrument can be used in conjunction with, uh, with other uh, methods. And then uh, you can do the measurements, if you ever come across this, with um, in, in a more knowledgeable sort of way. Or if you need to uh, obtain uh, in information which this instrument can give, you know what it can do. And also, uh, you know who to do a search. You can find out the people who are, uh, are running it or have it, and then can uh, make an informed discussion. Uh, when uh, deciding what needs to be done. So that's why I think uh, a bit of knowledge behind the technique is uh, is useful. So it's dynamic light scattering. And dynamic light scattering is a type of light scattering. So you've got a, a laser beam coming into, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a, a, a curvet, the sort we use in spectrophotometers. OK, so you just put your solution in uh, a clean uh, curvet and we'll come on to clarity in a minute. And then uh, it goes inside the uh, the instrument that lid is closed and then uh, laser light is shined at the solution of, uh, of molecules. And because the molecules are moving around because of you know Brownian motion, uh, then what happens is that the intensity of light scattered at a particular angle will, will fluctuate depending on how fast the particles are moving about. Now these fluctuations are too fast for the eye to detect the you know, nanosecond, microsecond time interval fluctuations. So although our eyes can't detect these fluctuations, uh, detectors can. And uh, that's what uh, these specialized detectors do. And then the intensity fluctuations are compared, and from that, information about the dynamics of the molecules using what's called the diffusion coefficient uh, are made. From the diffusion coefficient, we can get uh, size, uh, shape, and other information. That's basically a summary of the method, but uh, we need to get find out a bit more, you know, a bit more information how. The instrument uh, does it. So, in terms of uh, follow-up, uh, there's uh, these two books here, uh, which are in the uh, NCMH. And uh, when the NCMH labs are open again, uh, which hopefully will be shortly after uh, Easter, then uh, you guys can come across and. Uh, that's where I am now. You can come and see the labs. Uh, what's up, lad? Yeah, sure. So, labs just close the door. Uh, and then you can see the, the light scattering lab and all the other labs we have uh, with instrumentation, which is just uh, just just two doors uh, away. So hopefully we can do that uh, after uh, Easter. But chapters D3, D10 uh, of this excellent book, Methods of Molecular Biophysics, which I put online for you on the Moodle, so you can access the relevant chapters uh, there. Uh, and then there's this uh, old book now based on a meeting that uh, I organized uh, almost yeah, over 30 years ago, 1990. So before you guys were born, I think, uh, we had this excellent meeting in Cambridge, uh, laser light scattering in biochemistry. Uh, we did for the Biochemical Society. It was published by the Royal Society of, 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 of Chemistry. So there's this book. Again, I haven't PDF this yet, but I will PDF it and put it on the, the Moodle. Otherwise, there's, uh, there's multiple copies uh, in the uh, NCMH. So dynamic light scattering for measuring diffusion coefficients. 
and things that come from that. So why do we measure diffusion coefficients? Can you all see that? Can you all read that? Because uh, I've gone for the uh, the handwriting approach, which sometimes the you can get just mesmerized by uh, Times font, Arial font, Calibri font, Helvetica font, all this uh, beautiful font. Uh, but sometimes just straight handwriting, as long as you can read the lecturer's handwriting. <laughs> Hope you can read that, folks. Is that readable? Yes. Or is that terrible handwriting? No, no, it's readable. Yeah, apparently uh, GPs have got the worst handwriting. Doctors have got the worst handwriting. But uh, scientists are not that far behind. So I hope you guys are in the category of the nice handwriting rather than the, uh, the bad handwriting. And uh, actually, it's a shame because we're all used to tapping in stuff in the keyboard now, computers. When I was a PhD student, we just used computers for running computer programs like Fortran programs and all this for evaluating quadratic functions, integrations and things. We didn't use computers for preparing presentations or uh, sending emails. Emails didn't exist there or doing Word documents and things. That was all done by hand, which you'd pass on to uh, secretaries in the department. Uh, and in the case of my PhD, I passed it on to my mum because she was a school secretary. So uh, in those days, we had to write uh, used to handwriting, but that skill has been lost uh, largely because we all use computers now. So it's nice to handwrite sometimes. So I hope that's OK. So why diffusion coefficients? One, the diffusion coefficient, uh, which we can measure rapidly using dynamic light scattering, is a measure of the structure and the molecular weight of a biomolecule in solution. Uh, we can get the polydispersity or distribution of diffusion coefficients using the computer software. And that will give us a size distribution. That will tell us how disperse our material is, how pure our material is, whether there's aggregates present, or whether you have a broad distribution of polysaccharides, or whether you have a narrow distribution of polysaccharide, when you have different components and things. So it can tell you that information. And because we can make measurements quickly, we can look at changes in a process, dynamics of a process. And that's important, for example, if you're following uh, you know, crystallization trials of proteins and things. So uh, it really is a handy piece of uh, equipment. So there's one instrument, piece of instrumentation to come out of uh, uh, your time as a postgraduate and uh, one physical instrument, then I would say dynamic light scattering is uh, is near the top of the list because of its its economy and its uh, tremendous uh, versatility. Uh, when used correctly, of course, like any instrument, uh, it has to be used uh, correctly. And it's an instrument, not a machine. An instrument you have to interact with. A machine is something where you press buttons, and it does work for you. But uh, we deal with scientific instruments and dynamic light scattering is an instrument, uh, it's not a machine. So the first part is what's a diffusion coefficient? I'll tell you what that is. Uh, dynamic light scattering is not the only technique for obtaining it. I'll just give you a little hint of what else can be used to get the uh, diffusion coefficient. And then I'll show you how dynamic light scattering fits in with other types of light scattering analysis, spend a minute or two with that, and then show you how we get diffusion coefficients and particle sizes out of uh, DLS, that's the acronym for dynamic light scattering, and then some experimental points. And then finally, I'll show you how we can use diffusion coefficients. I'll give three or four nice uh, examples. So there's a bit of maths here. Don't, don't worry about the maths or any, any physics here. The physics is all covered by the, the computer software. But I'll just show you anyway to sh show you where this all comes from. Just to show we're not just doing it by magic or you know, there is some 
science behind the uh, the results that come out. So, uh, Mr. George Keshe, don't worry if you don't follow uh, some of this. Okay. Uh, so I'll just take you through quickly. So the diffusion coefficient is a manifestation of the ability of a particle to move uh, in a solution. Okay, things are moving, and some move faster than the others. Uh, and there's two causes. Uh, one is a concentration gradient. So if you have like just pure water or pure sodium chloride solution, and you pipette in a solution of ovalbumin or uh, cellulose or, or, or whatever, uh, then what happens is the, the cellulose and the ovalbumin will diffuse. It'll move, so it spreads out uh, to make a uniform uh, concentration. So it moves from a region of high concentration, which is the drop you put in, to a region of low concentration, which is uh, liquid which you're injecting it into. So J, uh, this is the diffusion equation here. J is the mass of particles crossing one centimeter squared cross section per second. So J is the flow or flow rate. And uh, DCDX, that's the changing concentration with distance. Uh, that's the concentration gradient. So what this equation says is the flow rate, J, is equal to uh, this constant here, D, which is the diffusion coefficient, times the concentration uh, gradient. And there's a negative here because the particles are moving from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. They're moving down the concentration gradient. That's why you've got a negative here. This is where the diffusion comes from in terms of a concentration gradient. It represents the rate at which the particles move uh, depending on the concentration gradient. And this is called uh, Fick's first law. The second cause of diffusion is caused by the thermal motion of the molecules because they have thermal energy then they're, they're moving around. So they've got energy, they're moving around. Uh, and that's called Brownian motion or Brownian uh, diffusion. And the equation for that is that the displacement, how far a particle moves at a given time, okay, and for how it moves, x or x squared equals 2 times the diffusion coefficient times the time. Uh, and it's the average of x squared. So uh, you take a, a time average and it's the average uh, x squared. And the reason why it's the square, the square is that the square uh, also takes away negative direction. So it, it can be this way or that way, that way or that way, positive directions, negative directions. But if you take the square of the distance, that gets rid of the negatives because negative times negative is positive. OK. So it's the mean square displacement. You divide it by twice the time. So take two and t come over to this side of the equation. So the mean square displacement divided by two and divided by the time equals the diffusion coefficient. And it's the same diffusion coefficient with this. It's just a different way of measuring it. Concentration gradient is one way, or looking at Brownian diffusion is another way. And this is the way we measure the diffusion coefficient using dynamic light scattering. We measure the, the Brownian movements of molecules. And the units of diffusion coefficient are centimeter squared per second. Centimeter squared divided by 2t, units of t is second. So the units of d are centimeter squared uh, per second. And this equation is most relevant to dynamic light scattering. Once you measure d, 
there's one or two little corrections you've got to do before you start interpreting it in terms of sizes and, 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 and things. It's what we normally have to do. Because the uh, diffusion coefficient will depend on the temperature and will depend on the viscosity of the solvent the molecule is in. If it's in pure water, then it'll move fast. If it's in a thick glycerol solution, then it'll move slowly. So in making comparisons or making deductions, you have to take into account the viscosity of the fluid and the temperature. So what we do is we make our measurement of the diffusion coefficient at a particular temperature in whatever buffer or solvent we're using. That's what this means, the diffusion coefficient at a particular temperature and, uh, and buffer. And then we correct the temperature. So 293.1 is 20 degrees centigrade divided by the uh, whatever temperature we measured in degrees absolute uh, we did the measurements in. And then there's this viscosity correction. Eta is the symbol for viscosity. So you multiply uh, the diffusion coefficient we measured in our buffer, our temperature T, by 293.1 divided by T. And also we multiply by the viscosity of the solvent uh, at the particular temperature. And then divided by the viscosity of water at 20 degrees centigrade, which is uh, it, 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 it's standard. Uh, it's point, uh, I think point oh one in uh, CGS units. So there's that little correction we've got to make, or we normally make. It's called normalization or standardization to standard solvent conditions. And the other little correction we've got to make is correct for non-ideality. And George and Keshe know all about this because uh, we did the did modality in the other modules caused by molecules getting in the way of each other and also by you know charge effects, uh, especially if you're working in low ionic strength uh, solvents. So uh, the way we get around that is to make measurements of a series of concentrations and extrapolate a zero concentration when these non-ideal effects go to zero. I will say that with dynamic light scattering, uh, we have a, an advantage over other techniques like viscosity and uh, sedimentation in that the non-ideality effects are usually much smaller. And that's because you've got two separate effects which can compensate for each other. One is what we call a thermodynamic uh, non-ideality effect. And the other is what we call a hydrodynamic non-ideality effect uh, caused by when molecules move through a liquid, solvent is pushed in the opposite uh, direction. And these thermodynamic and hydrodynamic non-ideality effects actually work against each other. And uh, that means that the uh, net non-ideality can be very uh, small. And this is something that we worked on uh, a long time ago when I was a, a post Doc in the uh, biochemistry department in, uh, in, in, in uh, at Cambridge. And we came out with this, do we see that this equation here, uh, where Kd is the concentration dependence of a diffusion coefficient. And you can see it has a term here, which is the thermodynamic term, 2Bm. Remember 2B, George, Kesha? 2B or not 2B? <laughs> Minus Ks, which is the concentration dependence term we get from sedimentation uh, velocity. So these two terms work against each other, meaning the concentration dependence is usually quite small. And that's very important because, as I said at the beginning of the, the talk, one of the applications of dynamic light scattering is for uh, looking at the behavior of high concentrations of monoclonal antibodies used in cancer uh, therapies. So at the high concentrations, the non-ideality effects are still small. That is a major advantage in terms of the uh, interpretations of the data, in terms of uh, conformations and uh, association and uh, interaction behavior. So that's uh, an unexpected bonus of the uh, dynamic light scattering technique. And I've given you the reference for this uh, 
at the end of the uh, end of the uh, the notes. Right. Well, I've said that. <laughs> this the diffusion coefficient tells very very interesting things about biomolecules. And uh, you're thinking, oh, well, go on, go on, Steve, go and tell us them. But before we do that, it's not the only method for getting uh, diffusion coefficients. We can use the ultra centrifuge using what's called uh, boundary spreading methods. And we can also use a nuclear magnetic resonance to get diffusion coefficients. But by far the most simplest procedure and popular is uh, dynamic light scattering which is why you're getting this lecture off me now. And uh, dynamic light scattering is not the only light scattering method. Uh, there's turbidity, which you can get uh, using a simple spectrophotometer. Uh, by turbidity, we mean uh, loss of intensity of an instant beam uh, on a solution which is not due to uh, absorption phenomena, uh, UV absorption phenomena and the change of electronic levels. So if we're doing uh, turbidity experiments on a protein solution, uh, we don't use 280 nanometers. Uh, why is that anybody? Why don't we use 280 nanometers if we're looking at scattering phenomena? Because they will absorb it. Yeah, they'll absorb. The aromatic groups will absorb at 280 nanometers. So we, we steer clear of uh, of those uh, wavelengths. And also with the. Uh, Can I just ask? Scattering. Yeah, sure. Uh, for this turbidity, is that also? Uh, can we use Turbiscan? Is that like an instrument for that or? Yes, I've not used that myself, but I think that's a turbidity based uh, instrument. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's more for looking at larger particles, uh, turbid, well, turbid solutions. You can see them uh, oh. being uh, uh, you know, fo foggy. And yes, turbidity yes. is also used for, for example, getting the concentrations of, uh, of bacteria, bacterial spores, mm -hmm. uh, from the uh, turbidity, uh, take for 60 nanometers and, uh, and this sort of thing. So we need a good quality spectrophotometer. Uh, which uh, gives good readings at uh, you know zero degrees uh, or close to zero degrees angle. Then there's classical light scattering where you don't measure the time fluctuations, but you measure the uh, average intensity as a function of uh, of angle and concentration. And this is what we did last term with the uh, SecMal's uh, light classical light scattering technique. I don't know whether you were that lecture lucidia where we did uh secmals in classical light scattering um, i don't i don't think i was yeah okay but we've got that technique here in the ncmh it's a very powerful method of getting molecular weight distributions of uh of polysaccharides uh and maybe your uh your fiber polysaccharides and mucins as well we were the we were the very first lab back in uh, 1996 to use SECMALs to characterize the uh, molecular weight distribution of mucins. Uh, this was published uh, by myself and Imo Friedberg, Imo, who's going to be teaching later on the course, and, uh, and Connie Jummel, who was uh, my postdoc uh, many years ago. So we were the first ones to, we were also the first ones to use SECMALs to get molecular weight distributions of polysaccharides out back in 1989-1990. Uh, we were the first in Europe to have this uh, instrumentation. OK, that's another story. The so dynamic light scattering is the focus uh, now. Now, to do, 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 do a bit of theory. Again, you don't need to know this. This is the physics behind the, the box. So this shows you how we get the diffusion coefficient. So just sit back, fasten your seat belts. Don't worry too much if you don't get some of this, but uh, I'll just show you where the diffusion coefficient comes from. So we have a monochromatic laser. Laser is monochromatic. You can't get non-monochromatic lasers, which means the light is it's monochromatic. It's 
It means it's single wavelength. Okay, a conventional light source like a, a lamp or something has uh, a wide range of wavelengths emitted. Uh, monochromatic light comes from lasers or filters, uh, but in this case it's lasers. And uh, for example, this is red light from a, say from a helium neon laser, 632.18 nanometers wavelength, so very precise wavelength. Or you could have other lasers, uh, green light, uh, helium cadmium light, uh, different red light sources, blue light, argon ion lasers. But you have a fixed wavelength coming at the solution, and then the solution scatters that uh, that radiation. And you pick, you detect the scattered light at a given angle, theta, by a detector, and then uh, the computer records the intensity. And intensity changes with time caused by the, the movements of the molecules. And the way the movements of molecules cause the intensity to uh, fluctuate is that if you're a detector here, okay, and the particles are moving, so they're absorbing light and re-emitting light almost instantaneously, but because they're moving, then the otherwise monochromatic light, 62.18 nanometers, to the detector or the observer, if the object is moving or it's absorbing emitting radiation, then the, the wavelength will appear to change slightly. This is called the Doppler effect. And it's like when you listen to a police car or an uh, ambulance or an airplane just going across now. <laughs> uh, if you hear an ambulance coming towards you, you you'll, you'll hear that it will change tone. It'll go, so the uh, the uh, the the wavelength will change or appear to change because that vehicle uh, emitting the sound is moving relative to you, and the same applies to moving particles scattering light relative to, to a detector. So the wavelength will change, and because you've got different different speeds and different people things are moving around different velocities and things you get different wavelength changes and when you get wavelengths that are very close to each other then you get interference or beating of the, uh, the waves and a change in intensity with time and these fluctuations will be more rapid if things are diffusing more rapid you tend to find that smaller particles diffuse more quicker than, than larger particles. You also find that compact particles diffuse more quicker than extended particles because the extended particles experience more uh, friction uh, resistance. So the detector computer system picks up these changes, measures this sort of Doppler fluctuations in uh, intensities. But what it does is it samples, it takes intensity at a given time and it compares the intensity at a given time t with different uh, time intervals separated by units of what we call the uh, the sample time tor s and depends on how uh, expensive or sophisticated your detector, what we call a correlator or autocorrelator which correlates, compares these uh, intensities is. If it's a, a relatively inexpensive correlator, then uh, we compare 64 time intervals at a time. Uh, if you've got a more expensive one, one to eight time interval time, or a new more expensive one, up to two, five, six time intervals, time uh, packets uh, at, uh, at, at, at a time. And then, uh, these comparisons are average. So basically, if, if an intensity, if, there's, if it's not moving at all, then the intensity at a given time will be very similar to the intensity uh, at the time close to it. But if it's moving fast, then the intensity will differ more. So uh, this is what 
autocorrelation is about. It's comparing the intensities at different time intervals. And the faster the particles move, then the less the intensities will uh, correlate. And the computer calculates what's called a, a correlation function, which is a measure of how these uh, intensities change with time. And uh, to get the diffusion coefficient, uh, what happens is that the uh, computer does a plot of the log of this correlation function, minus one, and uh, plots it as a function of these time intervals, tau. Uh, K is what's called a Bragg vector, which depends on the refractive index uh, n. Lambda is the wavelength you're using. Helium neon, one eight. And theta is the, the scattering angle, which you set the instrument uh, at. And the, the small box instruments we've, we've just showed you, that allows you to look at two scattering angles. You know, more expensive instrumentation, you can look at a range of different angles. So theta is the scattering angle. So you plot this against sample time tor. And that's the Bragg vector. We know what that is from the angle, wavelength, and the refractive index. So by plotting that against that, you get a straight line. And the slope is the diffusion coefficient. Channel number means these packets of time interval. Remember, I said it can go from 0 to 64, or 128, or 256. So it's plot of this correlation function, how the correlation decays with time as a function of time uh, or uh, we call channel channel number. And the slope gives a diffusion coefficient, which is a measure of the size and shape of the molecule. So for example, this large protein called dynein, whose molecular weight is 2.5 million, has a diffusion coefficient after correction to standard conditions of 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7 centimeters squared per second. That's the sort of typical value you get for uh, large uh, protein uh, molecules. For bigger particles like viruses and uh, bacteria, you'll get much smaller diffusion coefficients, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9, because they move more slowly. Or for smaller molecules, smaller proteins, uh, smaller carbohydrates and things, uh, then they'll move faster. So this could be 10 to the minus 6, uh, for example. So this is a measure of the size and shape of the particle. Just a word of caution, if you've got elongated molecules, then there's a a further complication you have to be aware of in the sense that uh, you need to make measurements at different angles and extrapolate to uh, zero uh, angle because of what's called uh, rotational uh, diffusion uh, complications. But uh, uh, that's why it's useful having a, at least a couple of angles so you can monitor for these, uh, these complications. But for things that are reasonably spherical, globular, uh, then uh, you don't have to do this uh, angular uh, check. And don't forget, Messidia, that many polysaccharides, although they're uh, linear in solution, they they coil up into sort of uh, overall globular uh, random coil types of conformations. Not all polysaccharides, but uh, many do. <laughs> Good. So just remember that when you get the future oceans to uh, correct standard conditions and uh, sometimes extrapolate to zero concentration to get that. Although I did say that the concentration dependence of a diffusion coefficient caused by non-ideality is relatively small compared to other techniques like viscosity and uh, sedimentation. But be wary that a concentration correction might be needed. So that's how we get the diffusion coefficient, folks. That's uh, 
Now, what did the instrumentation look like? Right. And that's what you call a scientific instrument, not a box. Well, there's a box computer here, there's a box here, but this is going back all right, 30 years. This is when I first came to Sutton Bonington. This is one of my first instruments that I that I uh, constructed, that, uh, that I had, I put together. It's uh, uh, a Marvin 4700 system, and this is the laser here, this large helium neon laser here. And inside here is the sample chamber. It's in uh, water, which is uh, uh, regulated. So the temperature is regulated. So we have a constant temperature. And the, uh, the Quebec sample container goes inside the, what's called the goniometer. And uh, we got this instrument from, Beck, from uh, Malvin Instruments. But it didn't come with a lid, so we had to make our own lid. And this is a, a baked bean tin lid, which we painted black, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, so inside here is the sample. And so laser light is shined at the solution. And then the light is scattered. And this is the detector here at an angle of 90 degrees. And this sends the uh, signal to this big box, which is called a correlator. So this did all the comparisons of intensities and things. So this is called the autocorrelator correlator system. And then after the correlations have been done, it's sent to the uh, computer. And you can see from the computer, this is an old computer with a floppy disk. This is what it was like, goodness me, uh, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, 1986, so 35 years ago when I got this set up. Had to be in a dark room, we couldn't risk any, any light. But this uh, was a scientific instrument. You had to interact uh, with it. It was uh, very careful, but it was good, uh, good fun. Contrast that with the modern instrument. This is the Marvin Nano synthesizer, which is that. It's still coupled to a computer, but the uh, computer does all the all the correlations, all the autocorrelations. There's no need for a separate, whoops, a separate. This is why you should use PowerPoint, not PDFs. Uh, separate correlator uh, system. So uh, that's how the technology has changed over the years. It's become very compact. Uh, the lasers have become compact. Uh, all the components have become uh, compact. Uh, and from a safety issue, uh, these instruments are much uh, safer, particularly in terms of exposure to uh, laser radiation. And you don't have to work in a dark room like we have to do in the uh, in the, the old days. Uh, and the, the cavettes, you've got the conventional cavet, but also this is a special cavette. Uh, and uh, this is what we call for uh, electrophoretic light scattering. So you've got to uh, uh, connections here to uh, positive and uh, negative uh, charges. So basically you, you, you can not only follow the dynamic light scattering movements, but also you can follow the movements of particles under the influence uh, of an electric electric field. And this is the basis of the, uh, the Mar Mar Marvin Nano Zeta sizer. And uh, it measures what's called the Zeta uh, potential, which is a measure of electrophoretic mobility. So you get the uh, diffusion coefficient, the dynamic lighting, that's what diffusion coefficient, and you can get the electrophoretic mobility uh, as well, uh, which makes this instrument even more uh, versatile. But we're not going to cover electrophoretic light scattering now. That's uh, much more uh, advanced than what we need. But as long as you're aware that this instrument can do other things besides measure measurement of diffusion coefficients, it can measure the what's called the zeta potential, which is a measure of the charge of a molecule, then uh, that's uh, useful information uh, to have. Uh, you need to be aware that you need to make sure your solutions are as clear as you 
possibly can make. In the old days, we had to be uh, scrupulously clear because if you had any contamination from any dust particles or large aggregates, then these dust particles, aggregates, they scatter light in much greater proportion than the smaller macromolecules you want to look at. So any contamination used to invalidate your measurements. So we went through all these elaborate procedures to make sure that the cavettes themselves were clean and the solutions were clean that we put into uh, them. Nowadays, it's not so critical because the software is so good. The software is very good at removing the, the signal that comes from aggregates or supramolecular uh, particles. Uh, programs like uh, Contin and other software packages are very good at uh, removing the effects of uh, contamination. But nonetheless, your solution should be as clean as possible. And also, it's no use getting your solutions clean and putting in a dirty cavette. Uh, you have to make sure that the uh, cavettes are clean as well. Uh, but not necessarily to this extreme like we used to have to do uh, years uh, ago. Right, so the final part is uh, what we can do with the diffusion coefficient once we've measured it in this very, I say simple, it's not simple in terms of physics, but simple in terms of operation, simple to use uh, method. We can get molecular weights, sizes, uh, size distributions or polydispersity. We can get estimates of the conformations of the molecules by what's called the uh, frictional coefficient and we can assay uh, dynamics of uh, processes. So five things we can get with this uh, method. So the first thing is uh, molecular weight. And so I'm a bit too trigger happy here. And to get molecular weight, we combine, normally we combine with the uh, sedimentation coefficient, which uh, we measure using analytical centrifugation. So did we do this with you, Lissager, or not? Did we do this at centrifuge? Um, I don't remember. No, right. with, no, not with me. I don't think so. During your PhD, I think you'll definitely meet the ultra centrifuge. So we'll show you uh, how we get sedimentation coefficients from that in, uh, in, in, in due course. But what we do is we combine the diffusion coefficient with the sedimentation coefficient from ultra centrifugation, and that gives us the molecular weight. Uh, it's another way of getting molecular weights of, uh, of molecules. That's the gas constant temperature. That's the density of the uh, solvent. And this is B bar is what's called the uh, partial specific volume which is the reciprocal density of the, the polysaccharide or, or protein. For example, for a polysaccharide, that value is about 0.63 uh, mils per gram. For a protein, it's about 0.73. So we get molecular weights if we know the sedimentation coefficients as well. And uh, well, this just explains how we get uh, molecular weight by that cup. That equation. It basically involves a uh, combination of that equation with the diffusion coefficient, which relates to the frictional coefficient, which is the friction properties of the molecule conformation, and the sedimentation coefficient, which also depends on the friction properties. Just combine those equations together, and the friction coefficient uh, disappears, and so does Avogadro's number, and you end up with this equation here, which is called the, uh, the Svedberg equation. Right, we get the size of the molecule by what's in terms of the Stokes radius or the hydrodynamic radius. And so we measure the diffusion coefficient. So long as we know what the temperature is and we know what the uh, viscosity of water is, which is 0.01 in CGS units, we could easily convert the diffusion coefficient into 
a hydrodynamic radius or radius of the equivalent sphere. So the particle may not be spherical, but this represents the equivalent radius of the particle had it been a sphere. And uh, when you get size distributions from dynamic light scattering, it's usually in terms of the equivalent uh, radius of the particle or the equivalent diameter of the particle. The software generally bypasses the diffusion coefficient stage and goes straight into determination of the, the size. Or the, by size, it means the Stokes radius, the radius of the equivalent sphere. So here's some examples, RH, H stands for hydrodynamic, so the hydrodynamic radius. Lysa's eye, 1.5 nanometers, hemoglobin, 3. This virus, turnip yellow mosaic virus, 30 nanometers. I suppose we should update this now and put COVID. I'm afraid I've forgotten what the COVID radius is, but maybe for the next year's lectures we'll put that in. And a bacterial spore, which is about uh, one, uh, one micron. So that's size. Confirmation. Uh, confirmation. Uh, we get uh, from either the diffusion coefficient or the sedimentation coefficient. Right, I mentioned before that the diffusion coefficient depends on the friction coefficient, the measure of the friction resistance of the particle as it moves through solution. And the same with sedimentation coefficient, that depends on the friction coefficient as well as the molecular weight. So we can use diffusion or sedimentation to get this friction coefficient, which you can get confirmation out. So there's uh, two stages to this. One is we get the friction coefficient, but you also get the, where are we? The frictional ratio, and friction ratio is the ratio of the friction coefficient of the molecule to a friction ratio of a sphere of the same mass and same dry and hydrous volume of the particle. So we don't get the friction coefficient directly, but the ratio of the friction coefficient of the molecule to that of a spherical particle of the same mass and dry and hydrous volume. So I'll show you how we get that. It's a simple formula for getting this ratio. Uh, and then we allow for the hydration of the molecule, that is the water binding of the molecule, to get something called the, uh, the pairing function. P, and pairing got a Nobel Prize for doing work related to this, believe it or not, back in the uh, 1920s. So we get the frictional ratio, first of all, and then we correct for hydration, the water bounds of the particle, to give the pairing function or frictional ratio due to the shape of the particle. And then from the pairing function, we get the conformation of the molecule out. And this is the first stage. So we get the frictional ratio from the diffusion coefficient by this equation here. So we need to know this is Boltzmann's constant temperature, viscosity of the solvent, viscosity of water, molecular weight, specific volume, which for Avogadro's number. And so from the diffusion coefficient, we know all this lot here, we can get the frictional ratio. Uh, or we can get it from the sedimentation coefficient. The equation is a bit different, but we can get the frictional ratio from that. So diffusion coefficient, dynamic light scattering. Uh, and then we convert it with this lot here to this frictional ratio. Or sedimentation coefficient from the centrifuge, convert it with all this lot here, and we get the frictional ratio. And then the final correction, as I said before, we need to correct for the, the water binding hydration of the particle. And this is the correction formula we use for that. So V bar is the specific volume of the dry particle. 
and uh, BS is the specific volume for the uh, for the swollen uh, or hydrated particle. And uh, B bar is dry particle is 0.73 or, or about that for proteins, 0.6 for polysaccharides. And for uh, proteins, BS is usually about 1.4, depending on how uh, how many hydrophilic groups the protein is. If it's a glycoprotein with sugar groups, it'll be a, a bit, bit more. If it's a polysaccharide, the VS will be a lot, uh, a lot higher. So we correct the take the fusion coefficient and we convert that to a frictional ratio. And then if we know what the water binding is, we can get this uh, shape function. And from the shape function, uh, we can get the shape. So if it's a simple protein, we can get the uh, axial ratio or ratio of the long axis to the short axis for these uh, ellipsoid shapes, prolate and uh, oblate ellipsoids. Prolate is, George, what sort of shape is a prolate ellipsoid? Kesha, can you remember? I can't actually remember, Steve. And also, I was just going to say, I'm sorry, my Wi-Fi wasn't working, so that's why I, ha I only just rejoined the call. OK, well, we play this back later when you you, you get it. But a prolate ellipsoid is a, the rugby ball shape, and the oblate ellipsoid is the uh, the disc shape or the M&M &M, uh, smarty shape object. So this shape function we can get from dynamic light scattering or from centrifugation. We, we mentioned this actually in the antibody lectures. Uh, we can get, this is the way we get it from the uh, conversion of the diffusion coefficient via the frictional ratio and allowing for hydration to get this shape function. And for more complicated shapes, such as antibody shapes, we represent as B models. This is from the, uh, the antibody lecture. Uh, we can model the uh, conformations of the molecules by comparing the experimentally measured values we get from dynamic light scattering and uh, sedimentation with the uh, computed values we get from particular models. So we can select the uh, best models which agree with the experimental data we get from diffusion, dynamic light scattering or sedimentation. Uh, and in this way, we can show whether antibody molecules, for example, are compact or extended structures uh, using this uh, B models. So Lucidia, although you will follow this because this relates to the antibody lectures, which the uh, which uh, Kesha and George did as part of the uh, MRES uh, course. But this is how we get though, with that mysterious P function, George Kesha, which I quoted in the antibody lecture on solution properties. This is where it comes from. We get it from the dynamic light scattering or the uh, centrifugation uh, sedimentation coefficient technique. So we get uh, molecular weights, sizes by the Stokes radius, conformations out. We get distributions of sizes. OK. This is from a recent paper with Mary, actually, because Mary's coming on uh, straight after me. There's Mary. Uh, we published a paper in scientific reports uh, last year on the effects of the antibiotic vancomycin, uh, which causes uh, complexation and aggregation of gastrointestinal and uh, submaxillary uh, mucin. So this little cute little molecule called vancomycin, which is a small uh, peptide, seven uh, what, what's, that, what's that? Septapeptide? What's a seven, it's a seven peptide uh, molecule with two uh, sugar residues, glucose and vancosamine, uh, on it. And this is a very important antibiotic. It's called the last line defense antibiotic against a bacterial uh, disease. It's normally injected uh, intravenously, but when used as an oral, uh, we found that it actually causes complexation of the mucins. It causes aggregation of the mucins. We showed that by sedimentation, by 
electron microscopy. But you can see it also uh, with, uh, with dynamic light scattering. This is the antibiotic by itself, so quite small. And uh, this is with in mixed with intestinal mucin, PIM. Uh, it sounds like a posh drink, doesn't it, PIM? PIMS. But this stands for pig intestinal uh, mucin at uh, different uh, concentrations. Uh, this is PIM by itself. The black trace is the pig intestinal mucin. And you add, you add the antibiotic, you get these uh, very high molecular weight uh, aggregates uh, being formed, which is exactly what we see with electron uh, microscopy. And note we're plotting the diameter here, not the Stokes radius, that's just twice the uh, Stokes uh, radius. So that's you know a very simple experiment, uh, what we can do with uh, dynamic light scattering. So Lucidia, if you're looking at complexation and things uh, involving dietary fiber uh, mucin complexes, then dynamic light scattering is one of the techniques that uh, you, know, you should be uh, uh, you should be using. Uh, can I can I ask? Uh, uh, can dynamic light scattering be used for gels? Yes, uh, but not in this way. Uh -huh. okay. It has been used for, uh, for for looking at gels, but that's a different topic. Uh, okay. Uh, and ultrasound navigation can also be used for gels. Mm -hmm. One of my postdocs uh, is theses here. Uh, oh, hell no. Someone's nicked it. Uh, it's one of these uh, uh, German PhD theses, but Helmut Kohlmann, from a postdoc, his thesis like this is what European PhD thesis looks like, like a little book. Uh, he his thesis was on the ultrasound navigation. I think dynamic light scattering of, uh, of, of of gels as uh, as 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 well. But I'll give you the references on on that later, Lucidia. Yes, great, thank you. Okay, right. I said it's it's such a versatile instrument. It's uh, it's fabulous, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just go to the last slide. Oh yeah, dynamics of processes because it's a uh, very quick technique. We can look at how things change with time. So this is a, a, a virus, not COVID. <laughs> this is a, a harmless uh, plant virus, southern bean mosaic virus. Uh, so not all viruses are nasty. This is quite a, uh, well, of course, if you're a plant, it's not very nice, but uh, uh, for us, it's quite harmless. So uh, this is actually Dave Sattel's data from this, uh, this book here, uh, Dave Sattel is one of the uh, the co-authors on the light scattering book. Uh, looking at the swelling of uh, southern bean mosaic uh, virus uh, with uh, time after addition of calcium ions, you can see it starts off at 30 nanometers diameter, and then uh, at 10, meters, 10 minutes in, it suddenly uh, starts to uh, expand. So that's an example of uh, using the technique for looking at dynamics of processes, but then we look at protein crystallization and uh, other things. By right, bibliography, folks, uh, there's some excellent tutorials, Melbourne Instruments and Wire Technology. There's the uh, chapters in uh, this book. And I think there's a chapter on gels in this book, uh, but I'll just check that uh, in a minute. And there's this uh, article on the uh, concentration dependence of macromolecular parameters. That's where we came up with this uh, equation, uh, which showed how the, the thermodynamic and the hydrodynamic concentration effects cancelled out, which was good. And then this review we did in uh, 2007, comparing dynamic light scattering with uh, ultrasound navigation. Uh, for uh, determining the integrity and stability of uh, monoclonal antibodies, which now everyone uses for characterizing 
antibodies. This is one of the first papers that was done by us. Nobman uh, works for uh, Malvern uh, Instruments. And that's it. I better stop now because we're invading into uh, Mary's uh, lecture. So uh, you'll need to play that this back again, folks. <laughs> There's a lot to learn from, uh, from that. But it is a very important technique in biopharma and the food industries because of its great versatility and relative uh, low cost, particularly now in biopharma in terms of the monoclonal antibodies and their importance for cancer treatments and our understanding of what happens at very high concentrations. Uh, are aggregates being formed or not? This is a technique which can show that and for uh, the very important field of, uh, of protein crystallization and uh, getting stubborn proteins to crystallize, finding the relative, uh, the, the relevant conditions to get crystallization. Good technique and relatively low cost. So uh, that's why uh, I guess it's important for you guys to know about it. All right, folks, that's it. So any questions on that before we move to Mary? I guess you'll have some questions, Mr. Jip, because I think this is one technique that you'll be using for your PhD. And uh, maybe George and Kesha later on will be, uh, Kesha, I think you will be, when you do the experimental part of your antibody project, you'll be using uh, DLS. And you'll see how simple it is to use. Don't be frightened by the physics. It really is a, a very simple method to uh, use. And we may even, George, be using this to look at uh, some of the microbes uh, in the uh, the curtain uh, project. And if we do look at some of the polymers, the soloxanes and things, then this is one of the techniques we'll be use, uh, using to look at these uh, antimicrobial uh, polymers uh, later on. It is easy to use. Right, guys, I'll stop recording now and uh, we'll move on to Mary. While we're just moving on, uh, we can grab a cup of tea, grab a cup of uh, coffee or something. I'll just get out of this and close the uh, recording. Uh, we've got Nasho joining us. Hi, Nasho. I don't know whether you got to hear that. Hi. Did you catch us any of that or you just joined us? Yeah, I joined like half an hour before. I just uh, had another meeting, so I didn't realize I had this one. OK, but uh, play it all again, because I think you got a bit at the end how important this method methodology is. I don't know what exactly you're doing uh, PhD wise. With, uh, with, uh, I'm doing a Master with of Research. What's up? I'm not doing a PhD, I'm doing a Master of Research. Oh, MRES, you're doing yeah. MRES like, a, yeah. OK, so do you have to do some taught modules as a, as a consequence, or you've already done those taught modules? According to my, according to the University of Nottingham website, I have to do 60 credits worth of taught modules, but uh, I I wasn't briefed about the course or anything as of yet. Uh, my course starts by April 1st, so I have no clue. OK, we'll discuss with you, because this could be one of your taught modules, because it's worth uh, 10, credits. 10 credits. Yeah, I saw that. And uh, the other MRS students are doing this as well. So uh, although not all here now uh, oh. are doing this. OK, so uh, stay. What we'll do now is log off. So yes, come out yes. of this and then rejoin us with the with Mary's lecture. I'll give you the link. OK, yeah. The, 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 do you know, do attend Mary's lecture because CD is also a very important method. I will characterizing uh, polysaccharides and particularly mucins and things. So uh, stop record. I'll stop recording now. If you switch off and then rejoin Mary's lecture and I'll see you in a minute. OK, yeah. thank you. See you.